Well, welcome everyone to 20th Street Baptist Church. Good to have you here with us today uh, to worship our Lord and Savior. So let's get our hearts and minds ready for worship and let's all stand. Turn your hymnals to number 579. And we're going to sing this one twice through. 579, He Has Made Me Glad. I hope He has made you glad today. All right, amen. say good morning to everyone that come by this way it's good to see each and every one of you uh, I want to say by way of announcement that we will have a choir practice this evening followed by our evening service at six o'clock <clears throat> um, we will go back to uh, our Wednesday night service where we go have uh, our revelation study and then that's the night that Rooted also meets. Speaking of Rooted, uh, if you notice in your announcement uh, about the shoebox ministry, uh, there's still time to donate that little tote board uh, box back there in the vestibule. Uh, put the items in that, and then some of the items that they could use is mentioned here in the bulletin. Um, we want to remember this Thursday is our men's fellowship breakfast at Burger King. And on Saturday, the 22nd, it's going to be our uh, meeting at Everoni's for our choir dinner. We have to be there at 4 o'clock when they first open, so we will be assured of seating. So if you're a member of the choir and you want to bring your spouse, which is good, it lets everybody be there at 4 o'clock and rush the door when they open. <laughs> Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we truly thank you for this day and for what it means to us where we can come together in worship and praise and the fellowship with one another. Lord, we want to remember that we are all Christians by, and we need to show that by our love that we show for each other. We want to pray for Matthew this morning as he brings your word in sermon to us. Lord, prepare our hearts and minds to receive the message that you've laid on his heart. And Lord, we want to truly thank you for our pastor and his wife for their ministry here in our church. They have made a great uh, uh, work in the ministry here, leading us and guiding us. And Lord, that they're trying to uh, inspire each and every one of us to follow your will and, and your, stay in your word and prayer. And uh, Lord, we want to pray that when we live, leave church today, that we will leave with uh, a song in our heart and be glad that we were here today. And may we return tonight. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Let's all stand, church. Turn to 470 in your hymnals. Without him. And we'll do, uh, well, the entire hymn.
As we get ready to take up our offering, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Richard, would you pray for us, please? Again, good to have you in the house of the Lord today. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, you guys are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? But we've come collectively to worship our Lord and Savior because indeed he is worthy of worship. All right. Um, we're, gonna, we're going to continue, Lord willing, our message series this morning on disarmed principalities and powers. In other words, the area of demonology and angelology, the angels. We're going to take a look at Mark 5, verses 1 through 20 again. We'll pick up where we left off last Sunday, if you will. This is part two. Mark 5, verses 1 through 20. I will confess to you, I did not get very far. I'd hope to finish out this short little series today, but there will be part three next week. I got hung up on maybe one or two verses and before I knew it, I had five pages or more. So I thought I better quit. <laughs> but that's okay. That happens sometimes. Now, let me just say before I do read the text and pray with you, um, just to kind of note the beginning here, in addition to the scriptures, I attribute much of what I have learned and gathered on the subject to, to uh to the biblical scholars and theologians, those such as like Lewis Chafer and Merrill Unger and Reynolds Showers and others, um, some of them quite recently, and then also throughout the course of my own biblical study over the years. Uh, I want to kind of um, preface today's message with that note. Sometimes I uh, will make or present you information in my own words, but it does have that support or the backing of that. Uh, also, I will quote when I when I present to you a direct statement, I will quote it for you. And therefore, I hope not to commit plagiarism. All right, let's look at our text today. Mark five. Sorry, I forgot to chew my cough drop before I stepped up here. So I'm going to chew it. Do you hear the crunch? That's a problem with the mic right up to your right. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm afraid I'll spit it right out at you. All right. Mark 5, let's look at verses 1 through 20, and then we'll pick up with verse 7 here later on when we get to the body of our message. The scripture says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. 
And when he had come out of the boat, that is Christ, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Verse four, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying out, and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he, Jesus said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion for we are many and also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2000 and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. And then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled and by our hearts. Dear gracious almighty God, we praise you this morning. We thank you this morning. We acknowledge your superiority, your power, your divinity as the son of the living God. God in the flesh, God manifested, become a man to die for sinners, Lord, to be buried, to rise again the third day. Lord, all, all are and will be accountable to you. And Lord, we just praise you this morning and ask your guidance, your spirit who is in us as believers to lead us in all understanding, along with your written word, the revelation, Lord, of the Bible. We pray these things in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Demons are real and have been active in the world since the dawn of human history. Many would refute that. We not only read of their exploits throughout scripture, which are God opposing and oppressive toward mankind, but their extra biblical mention is found in various ancient cultures as well, dating back to early Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the Greco-Roman world. Merrill Unger, in his book, Biblical Demonology, he observes that, quote, ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, and Assyrian historical records literally swarm with demons. And clay tablets containing countless incantations, spells, omens, exorcisms, magic rituals, and evidences of spirit traffic have been dug up by modern archaeologists from the mounds of buried Mesopotamian cities. Traffic, he says, traffic in the realm of evil spirits goes back in most ancient times to the antediluvian world, that is prior to the flood, the great flood. These times, Unger writes, are, quote, replete with examples of the cultivation of the demonical arts. Close quote. Now such arts are still heavily practiced 
practiced in today's modern cultures around the world. We see them in cultism or occultism and various forms of religion, even within Christianity itself, to a certain degree. Now, while the usage of the word demon in its ancient language can be found as far back as Homer's Iliad and Odyssey poems, as well as the Platonic period, Plato and such and others, it's not until the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament in the third century BC called the Septuagint that the term enters the biblical worldview or biblical arena. And though the Hebrew uses various, that is the Hebrew language, uses various connotations, it is translated from the Hebrew word shadim. That's a plural word. The singular is shade. Shadim as devils. It's translated as devils or more correctly, properly demons. For example, you find it in Deuteronomy 32 verse 17 which I'll leave that to you to note. The word devils you will find there, shadim, which is translated more properly demons. Now the Greek equivalent in the New Testament is daimon, not diamond, but daimon. And although the evolution or that fancy word etymology, which is the development of a word over the centuries, But although the evolution of the word demon has a sordid past, it has come to properly refer to its biblical usage that describes a spirit being which is morally bankrupt and can do naught but evil. You see in ancient times and mythology and heroic, like the period of the Homeric period and heroes and legends and what have you, there were such a thing as good demons or familiars. They even referred to them as gods at some point. But let me just state, there are no good demons. And neither can they be redeemed or desire to be so. Now the Bible does tell us, tell us however, that the holy angels, at least those in obedience to God, they do look or long to look into the wonders of the gospel and its salvation of mankind. They do, they do desire that in, first, uh, in Peter. Peter tells us. And though once sinless, when originally created, these fallen angels or demons are now wickedly sin-filled, seeking only to hinder God's work and to torment people, unsaved and saved alike. Because mankind is created in God's image, as we spoke about last Sunday. Now, I'm taking it for granted, at least, uh, that you were here last Sunday, or at least saw the message online. If not, I invite you to do so. Many speculate their origin, the origin of demons, if you will, ranging from the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, those giants, if you will, you find in Genesis and throughout Numbers, in ancient, the ancient uh, history of Israel. But many speculate their or origin, ranging from the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim or, or evil dead men to the destruction of an assumed pre-Adamite earth based on Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Yet, based on that which is available in Scripture, it is most likely, or best understood, that these are fallen angels, when we refer to demons, which willfully join Satan in his rebellion sometime after the sixth day of creation, after which God called, or had called, everything he had made very good including the angelic hosts of heaven up to that point. If there were fallen angels, he wouldn't call it very good, you see. 
Reynolds Showers writes, quote, that that evaluation indicates that sin was non-existent in every part of his creation, including the angels. Speaking of the sixth day when God called it very good. And then on the seventh day, of course, he rested from all that he had made. Now, in our modern times, the idea that there exists actual demonic spirits that possess intellect, will, and emotions. In other words, they have attributes of personality and are powerful and free to roam the universe is often met with skepticism or even scorn by many in the professing Christian community. Quote, many in a boasted age of science and enlightenment, dismiss the biblical claim as a mere remnant of medieval superstition or treat the whole matter as an amusing joke, writes Unger, further commenting that, quote, men in the church and out of it blatantly assert that there is no personal devil, that the devil is only evil personified, and that whatever devil there is is in man himself, and that there is enough of that variety to answer all theological requirements. It is also confidently declared that no longer can a respectable scholar be found anywhere who believes in a personal devil or demons. That's kind of the thought process today, especially even among the Christian community and theologians. So let me just say to you this morning that no respectable believer can afford to disbelieve that the devil and his angels are real and active in the present cosmos. One sure way to let the devil in your front door is to allow oneself to be convinced that he or his cohorts, that is the devil and his demons, do not exist. <laughs> That's a gift to them. That's what they desire. That's what they hope for. You see, those from whom Jesus cast out demons, I think, would wholeheartedly agree with that statement. Mary Magdalene, for instance, out of which Jesus cast seven demons, the Bible says in Matthew 16, 9 and Luke 8, verse 2. Or the blind and mute man out of whom Jesus cast a demonic spirit, Matthew 12, verse 22. Or the many out of which Jesus, when he walked this earth, cast out demons with a word, a single word, Matthew 8, verse 16. Then there is the demon-possessed Gadarene in our text today, this morning. I wonder what he might say to today's skeptics. You see, Peter was not referring to fairy tales or caricatures when he warned Christians, saying in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Close quote. From Scripture we learn that Satan is the prince of demons. And his angels willfully obey him. Revelation 12, 7 and Mark 3, 22, his demons, his angels, they willfully obey the devil, he and his purpose. And he's described the devil and his purpose, his character, if you will, to a point, is found in Isaiah 14 in the Old Testament and Ezekiel chapter 28. You will find mention of his pride, his agenda, if you will. Now, here's the key and what we need to center on. The eternal son of the most high God, Jesus the Christ, is vastly superior than Lucifer, who is a created being as well as the angels. And that's what this is about. It's about the glory and power of Christ, not the fear of demons or the devil. Because the Bible says, for to which of the angels did he, God, ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. 
And again, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. That is Christ. Let all the angels of God worship him. He has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but to Christ. Hebrews 1 verses 5 to 6 and Hebrews 2 verse 5. And so in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, we read that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He came in the form of a bondservant, although he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God because his divinity never left him. He was always fully God, yet fully man. You see, to save men from their debt of sin, which is death and eternal torment, God had to become a man. And take our place. He, could, he didn't become an angel. He didn't come to save the angels, the demons, if you will. He became a man. He had to be that which, which he was to save. Yet this in no way diminished his power and authority. But rather, it put it on full display before all the created universe to marvel at. That God should become a man. A little lower than the angels. Out of his love for mankind. You see, in the power of the cross... That is, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, Jesus, quote, disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. That is the cross and its victory. Colossians 2.15. I touched on that last Sunday. So. And so getting to our text today, having crossed the Galilean Sea to the southeastern shore of Jersa, and the Gadara region or country, Jesus and his disciples disembarked only to be confronted by the demon-possessed man who lived in the tombs and the mountains there. And we're told in the text that night and day he cried aloud inarticulately and cut himself with stones. The locals were unsuccessful at keeping the man bound with fetters and chains. Because the demons called legion that had entered him gave him supernatural strength to shatter and pull them apart. We're told in verse 4 of Mark 5. And seeing Jesus, the demonic, immediately runs to the Lord and falls at his feet. Sees him from afar and comes and falls down, not in worship, but to pay homage. That is, he makes a formal public acknowledgement of Jesus' divine origin and superior authority. The demons did. And so following last week's sermon, we pick up here with verse 7 in Mark chapter 5. Where it reads, backing up to verse 6 to give us an intro. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him or fell at his feet. Verse 7, and he, the demon, the man, the demon possessed man. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you? Jesus, son of the most high God, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So having fallen at the feet of Jesus, the loud voice with which the demoniac cries out is the Greek megaphone. You know it as a megaphone. You've heard people speak through a megaphone. How loud it can be. And the Bible, you see, tells us with certainty that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to God. Referencing Isaiah 45, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 14, verse 11, For it is written, 
As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And again, in Philippians 2, verse 10, Paul writes, quote, that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow. Now listen, of those in heaven, that's the entire angelic host, and those on earth, and of those under the earth, leaves out no one. And although the disciples had recently questioned Jesus' identity after he had calmed the windstorm on the Galilean Sea, and they said, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? The demons right away know, and they publicly acknowledge Jesus' divinity, that in him the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily, and as the second personage of the triune Godhead, he is creator of heaven and earth, as well as all creatures, including them. He is the one, capital O, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and to whom all judgment is committed. Colossians 1, 16 and John 5, verse 22. Now, it's interesting in the account of... Now, it's interesting in the account of Mark that the same response occurred previously when Jesus and the disciples entered the synagogue in Capernaum, kind of a base of operations there in the Galilean area and Jesus' Galilean ministry. But the same response occurred there in the synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath when they were confronted with another demon-possessed individual. And you find it a few chapters back in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 21. Let's read it together. I pray you have your Bibles. And you will notice the similarity. It says, then they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Now, Capernaum is kind of north westward on the shores of the Galilean Sea. Uh, uh, Jerusa or Gadara is southeast of the sea. But anyway, here in Capernaum, he entered there on the Sabbath. He entered the synagogue and taught in verse 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Verse 23, now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit a foul spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now you see, demonic activity had greatly increased during Jesus' earthly ministry. Yet he, keyword, commanded them out of their hosts, and they obeyed him. The king was in their midst, hallelujah. Not just any king, but the king of kings. Mm. These miracles were but a token, though, of the promised kingdom that was offered to Israel. Because Messiah, as I said, was in their midst, Luke 17, verse 21. And for example, we read in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 8. Matthew says or records these 12, the disciples, these 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. 
Freely you have received, freely give. Now when the Pharisees challenged Jesus' messianic authority, accusing him of having a demon himself, Beelzebub they called him, Jesus rebuked them and stated in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 28, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come up upon you. Now one thing we must not do is confuse this present age with the kingdom age that is to come, which the world under a theocracy will be ruled by Christ reigning from David's throne in Jerusalem, which is promised him in fulfillment of that Davidic covenant. So do not confuse this with kingdom now theology. And I'll leave that to you to research possibly. Kingdom now, dominion now theology. In his book, The Coming Kingdom, Andy Woods, Dr. Andy Woods demonstrates that, quote, the offer of the kingdom is the idea that the kingdom was offered to the nation Israel by John the Baptist Christ and the disciples rejected by the nation, postponed, and eventually will be reoffered to the nation during the future tribulation period. You see, Jesus' miracles, the exercising of demons, and his transfiguration in Matthew 17 were and are to be interpreted as, quote, Woods goes on, quote, mere tokens, that is a foreshadowing of the coming kingdom, rather than announcing an inaugurated form of the kingdom. See, the king was in their midst. God was in him and through him and working. He was God manifest in the flesh. And he was there to fulfill that messianic covenant to Israel. But they had rejected their king and thus rejected the kingdom. But God will fulfill it. Because he always keeps his word. And so that day is coming in the future. When both king and kingdom will be present and received on this earth. And so the Gadarene demoniac acknowledges Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah of Israel publicly. Because he referenced him as son of the most high God. And this appeals to Jesus' superior power as Messiah. And this title was used in the Old Testament among Gentiles, observes John Grasmick. Who says, quote, to refer to the superiority of the true God of Israel over all man-made gods. All those false gods that men prop up that can do nothing for them. Can do nothing but open a doorway to de demonic influences. The demon pleads to God that Jesus does not do two things. That he does not torment them before their time by sending them to the abyss. Mark 5, 7, Matthew 8, 29, Luke 8, 31. Or send them out of the region, the country. Mark 5, verse 10. Right? Verse 7 and verse 10 in Mark 5. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. And then in verse 10, it says, Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the region or country. Now, Matthew records there in this encounter before the time. Matthew adds before the time, they say. Do not torment, torment us before the time. And on the same event in his gospel, Luke records in chapter 8, verse 31, using the English Standard Version, if I may today, Quote, and they begged him in this situation, and they begged him, Christ, not to command them to depart into the abyss, the abuso. That's how we put that together using the other synoptics to get a full view of what's happening here. Now, Scripture indicates that there are free roaming demons and that there are those who are already bound and reserved for judgment. 
Jude 1, 6, 2 Peter 2, 4. The abyss or bottomless pit here refers to Tartarus. That's what they're talking about. You find it mentioned in 2 Peter 2, 4 and only there. Tartarus, which is said to be as far below Hades as earth is below heaven. In 2 Peter 2, 4, the Greek word Tartarao is translated in English as hell. But in the Greek, it is more specifically Tartarus. And that's what it should be thought of as. You see, it's not Hades or hell in general, which is the abode of the dead. But it's far below Hades and is distinct from Hades. Some call it a subterranean compartment deep, deep down. But neither is it a reference to the lake of fire or what some call Gehenna. Tartarus is known as the deepest pit of gloomy darkness for which is reserved, according to the Greeks in their ancient culture, is reserved brutal monsters and the vilest of criminals. In ancient Greek and Jewish writings, Tartarus is its own unique place of punishment for evil, renegade angels. A terrible place for them to be cast. That's why they beg, don't, don't tor torment us before our time. Now they know they're going there. They know they're to be judged. And by their plea... As they fell at Jesus' feet, possibly Jesus was prone to reduce the demon population by sending them straight to the abyss. He didn't mess around. Now, such imprisonment of these demons in Tartarus or the Abuso, the abyss, would be temporary. Because in the final future judgment, Satan, along with his angels, will ultimately be cast into the eternal lake of fire created for him and his angels, the Bible tells us. In Revelation 20, verse 10, and Matthew 25, verse 41. Matthew 25, verse 41 is where you find scripture telling us that hell or the eternal lake of fire was created for the, the devil and his angels. You see, the, God's word says that you will either follow the devil or Jesus. Those are your choices. The former leads to eternal hell fire and the latter to eternal paradise. It is not God who sends people to hell. It was made originally for the devil and his angels. So it's not God who sends people to hell. It is by one's own will and rejection of Christ. That sends them to eternal damnation. And you find in Ephesians chapter 2. Where Paul. Explains it or. Implies if you will. In that. Familiar passage of grace through faith. In his epistle. The Ephesian epistle. And he starts the chapter off. At least the first three verses. He says and you he Christ made alive you. Who were dead in trespass. In other words, you sinner. He, Christ, made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according. Listen now. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling desi the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. There's only two groups, those bound for hell, those bound for heaven. And Christ Jesus, by grace through faith in him, is that pivotal point, that pivot point that will determine your destiny, your eternal destiny. Make no mistake, in the final judgment, those not found in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire created for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20 verse 15 tells you. Now in Mark 5 verse 9, That the demon spokesman calls himself legion. 
due to the number of demons possessing the man, reminds us of the vast multitude of the angelic host originally created in the beginning. You find in verse 9, chapter 5 of Mark's gospel there. Let me read it real quick with you. He says there, Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. You see, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, John sees and describes when he's caught up, after being caught up in the spirit to the heavenly throne, the heavenly realm. And while there, John sees in chapter 5, John sees and describes the many angels that are about God's throne. And he uses the Greek word myrios and myrios. We know it as myriad. That is 10,000 times 10. Thousands and thousands of thousands. Myriad representing a group of 10,000. In other words, too many to count this angelic host. And of these, the Bible tells us that Satan convinced or drew one third in to join his ranks in rebellion. The fallen angels, the demons. Thus, both sinless angels and those that fell into sin are beyond computation in the created universe. It's hard to fathom how many there are. And in verse 10 of Mark 5, these, this demon or the legion, they beg Jesus not to send them out of the country, out of the region, which consisted of a decapolis. Or ten cities. It was a ten city region. That's why it's called the Decapolis. Apparently they did not want to be sent into exile. They didn't want to be tormented. Sent to the Abuso or Tartarus. They didn't want to be sent out of the area. Because maybe they would be unable to possess a body. Right? They wouldn't be able to do what they are prone to do. Targeting the swine, the demons seek Jesus' permission to enter them instead. They're always looking for a body. See, they're bodiless spirits looking for a host. In verses 11 through 12, right? Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And of course, Jesus at once gives them permission. Always seeking God's permission. You see, the devil and his demons can do nothing that is not father filtered. They cannot do anything without permission. And I hope to pick that up next Sunday. But let me leave you with this in the conclusion today. I want to reemphasize the premise here, the underlying tone of the encounter is Jesus' divine superiority. Over all things created, which includes the myriads of angelic hosts, both the faithful and the fallen, which includes Satan as well as his demons. That's the premise. It's not that we fear the devil or his angels, but that we healthily fear God. In a healthy way. The cosmos, where this present evil age and its dominion, its system, its world system has been temporarily usurped by the devil and his angels. That goes into another deeper theology with Adam and Eve. Adam was to be the tenant administrator for God. God, through Adam, governing what he had created, representing God in his likeness, his image. But the devil cannot create. The devil can't make legions of angels to, to, in order to follow him. He has to convince and draw them, deceive them, which he did. But then he also deceived Eve and Adam. And they lost their dominion over to the devil, who is now prince of this age and ruler of this world. As a result, how does he do it? He rules through the unsaved. He rules through governments. He rules through influential suggestions, if you will, and activities, sometimes possessions. Ultimately, he's going to rule through the Antichrist in that final seven years, that final hour on this earth. 
That's also why Jesus had to become a man to save us. The devil and his angels, they are not slack in causing confusion, division, and wickedness in this world, especially the church, especially doctrinal. They can and will at times possess the unsaved. And they can and will try to influence the disciples of Christ. To lead you astray. They make your ears itch. And they do this mainly through deceiving spirits. Deception. That's why Jesus warned about deception. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. Deceiving spirits and bringing heretical doctrine into the church. It's one of the main ways they influence the Christian body. First Timothy chapter four, verse one, Paul said concerning these latter days, these latter times. Now the spirit, the Holy Spirit, God especially says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. That's happening on a grand scale today. Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. You know, of course, this leads to the final apostasia or the, what we call the great apostasy that Paul mentions in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that will usher in the coming Antichrist. Until then, the very beloved John wrote five books of your Bible. The very beloved John reminds believers of who they are and who their enemies are. You see, we're not to be ignorant of the enemy. In 1 John 5, verses 18 through 19, again, the ESV version, if I may use that translation, says that, quote, we know, John wrote, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him. And the evil one, the evil one does not touch him. Those who are born again. Jesus already prayed for you in John 17 to keep you from the evil one. But he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know, he says, we know that we are from God. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Lies and wickedness. And this means. Comments of David Gusick. We can be free to be what we are in Jesus and separate ourselves from the world system that is in rebellion against God, against him. Fear God, not the devil. Amen. You see, it's interesting. Sometimes when we think about demons and demonology. Only God is omnipresent. We give too much credit to the devil and his minions sometimes. Angels and demons, they have locality. They're limited in their power. Make no mistake, they can be harmful, but they're limited. You might recall in Daniel ten thirteen when the angel... That contended with the prince of Persia there in that location, that geography. He had to call on Michael, the archangel, to come and offer assistance so that this messenger angel, supposedly Gabriel, could get to Daniel. So, yes, demons are real, but they're not divine. They have limitation. Let's bow our hearts. The gracious Almighty God, praise you and thank you today for your message. We praise you for the revealed word of God, which you've given us, Lord, your holy scripture, that we should not be ignorant or children of the darkness, that that day should take us unawares or that we should lack discernment. Lord, I pray your mighty hands upon us, as always, leading us and guiding us, protecting us. Lord, I pray you continue to conform us as your word promises, and we know you will. I pray, Lord God, that we do not quench the spirit. 
or grieve the Spirit. But Lord, that we magnify your name in our hearts and minds and our lives, being your people, your representatives. Lord, I pray we not be deceived, in other words. Thank you for all your love and mercy. Thank you for being our strong tower. Because the righteous run into you, the righteous run into you and are safe. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and let's all sing. Four hundred thirty five. bless you. It's so good to see you all today coming in fellowship to worship God. We will come back tonight at six o'clock. Hope to see you then. Choir at five o'clock. Uh, thank you all for all that you do for the church. Uh, I want to specifically commend the deaconry, all these deacons who have given of themselves and sacrifice and have a heart for God and for his people. And I want to thank you for that diligence and commitment. Thank you, each of you. Uh, and also every, each of you, all of you, you know, who put forth that effort to serve the Lord and his ministry. One day you will receive your crown. One day. All right. Who's our prayer warrior today? Brother Estel, dismiss us, please. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to have to be here today. Thank you for the wonderful message that you've given the pastor. Thank you for each one here and each one that's represented. And as well as you go with us and help you leave this place and be with us for what you're care for us until the next time you need to be. So we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Keep you making your face shine upon you.
important.